Hi, everybody. We're almost reaching the end of this journey together. I will have some time at the end to add the personal comment to the topics that we just talked about because uh, up until this point I, I tried to, uh, and up until the, the last uh, part, I will try to uh, just summarize and uh, um, translate what, what I read uh, in the book that we are talking about. Uh, but uh, at the end I hope to be able to extract what I think are the take-home messages of this project, the downsides of this approach, what can be done better in the future and how I hope to contribute to this. So today we talk a bit more about the utility of symptoms and specifically how they uh, defend our particularity. And then we will talk more in depth about a concept that we saw before, the idea that there is something inherently incurable in life and humans. We start talking about the first argument of today by focusing on the difference in role between cognitive therapies and psychodynamic therapies. Uh, and let's talk about the former first. If the unconscious is denied and the symptom is not taken as an example, a manifestation of something we are and we desire, then it's just a hindrance. And our goal as therapists is to maximize adaptability and functionality of the individual. That is what it means to be cured, to limit the unwanted. And how can that be done? Cognitive therapies seem to aim at the identification with the reality principle. The self is fortified at the expense of the unconscious, that becomes smaller and less influent uh, and adapts to the needs of the awareness. Let's see more of this by making some examples. Depression in cognitive therapies is interpreted as a consequence of distortions. Cognitive distortions and beliefs lead to feelings of depression. The perception of reality as negative is what triggers the negative emotions typical of depression. And a way to pursue the reality principle is to work on the assumptions that reality cannot be that negative. So it must be that the patient is misevaluating it. So instead of making the emotions and desire of the patient central, it's the objectivity of reality that's central. Like there could be anything objective. It follows that the purpose is then to teach the patient that reality is not as negative as perceived. And this should already make things better. Another example for a person afraid of spiders, uh, the assumption made is that there is a misjudgment of danger. Not all spiders are dangerous, so logically it doesn't make sense that uh, one would be afraid of all spiders. Techniques used in these cases are exposure, where there is a gradual approach with the cause of phobia, and rationalization. Explaining, for example, that there are dangerous spiders for which it makes sense to be scared. And the assumption of these two treatments is, again, that the patient is suffering from some kind of irrationality, that an encounter with reality will be able to cure. One last, one last example uh, is the one of sexual problems, uh, like premature ejaculation. What is happening here is a loss of competency, mental and physical. So again, there is an aim of adapting to a normality of being. Breathing exercises and techniques of control of thoughts and muscles should be able to restore that. And of course, having regular intercourse. So all these examples to highlight a standardization tendency. People want their own well-being, and if they find themselves unable to reach it, it must be that some distortion is going on. Because ultimately, everybody wants the same things. We just need to help them correct these errors that impeded them to reach their goal. For Recalcati, the destiny of the man who was given his competency back is an anonymous efficiency, an efficiency without desire. What happens with psychoanalysis instead is an alliance with the symptom. Instead of working on the assumption that reality is not bad, humans want their own well-being, therefore anything that deviates is an error, they validate the existence of the symptom as an example of everyone's particularity. There are exceptions to this alliance. Uh, if in fact in neurosis the patients have uh, parted from their desire and need to be reconnected with it, in psychosis there is an opposite issue. The unconscious, the removed, is perceived as a threat and it's not recommended to work on its strengthening. So except in these cases, generally there is a collusion with the unconscious. So it's a concept that we have been repeating in different forms in the previous episodes. Regardless of the approach used, uh, it's the philosophy behind that makes them different. One sees the symptom as a communication method. The other sees, as a, sees it as an accident. And there is no way to say whether there is more truth in one or the other. It's a matter of what do we personally see as more valid? Which one do we identify ourselves with? And this question can only be posed uh, once we have a clear view of what is out there. So, 
Regardless of an increasing skepticism towards psychoanalysis, at least in its most traditional forms, it seems like today we are living in a psychodynamic epoch. There is a generalized disinhibition that is enacted and praised, and many of the ideas that were more controversial one century ago, like the Oedipus complex or childhood sexuality, are today not as shocking. This, we could say, uh, is the acceptable side of the unconscious. What is harder to swallow, and was also at Freud's times to the point that many of his followers didn't agree with him, is the death drive. Being a witness to the First World War and its monsters, Freud started noticing a different pattern. Why does it seem that some people don't want to heal? That they repeat over and over things that are ultimately painful for them? So if on the one hand we have uh, hysterical patients that struggle with the repression of some parts of themselves, of which they only perceive fragments, on the other there are soldiers who fixated on trauma, ending up on repeating it indefinitely. And this makes Freud wonder, could there be a dual movement of the unconscious, of the drive? Can we have the desire that moves us forward toward change and creation, while also having a more conservative part that wants us to regress and that is hostile to change? And in this question lies the most controversial assumption of psychoanalysis. Is there a strip? Is there a death drive? Literally an urge to restore an earlier inanimate state of being? He saw war, uh, our love for distraction, how some of the people who survived they never actually healed. And on top of that, he, anal he analyzed this grandson's play and saw that there seemed to be a pleasure for him in losing the object of his love. We will see more of this game in the next part. All these observations in real life and in clinical experience brought Freud to the conclusion that we love the excess, the danger, the rupture of balance. There is a part of ourselves that does not pursue our well-being. Remember when we said that psychoanalysis believes that an excessive fortification of the identity and not its weakening leads to mental illness? Here we understand more about the why. And an example to do that is to think of narcissism, the extreme defense of the identity like cancer cells or excessive immunological defense that lead to an internal aggression, narcissism destroys while trying to protect, to overprotect. So instead of pursuing well-being, we pursue a rigid protection of the identity that leads to destruction, that is uh, the dead drive. Let me give you some time to digest this and we will see more of it in the next and last episode. For now, as usual, comment or email me with any questions and see you soon.